you who are just joining, welcome. This is Sin Bio Beta Live, and my name is John Cumbers. I'm the host and the CEO and founder of Sin Bio Beta, and we're an innovation network that brings together people working at the intersection of technology and biology. Of course, we're in the midst of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and we're joined by a global audience of passionate scientists and entrepreneurs looking to make a big difference in the world. We want to know where you're dialing in from. So if you open up the chat box below and just type in and say hi, we'd love to know where you're from, who you're affiliated with, and, uh, and where, you're, uh, where you're dialing in from today. So please type them into the chat box and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get started on our presentation shortly. Before I introduce Dr. Scheumann, we have an audience poll that I'd like to bring up. And we have two polls for you today. And this poll, uh, the first poll, if we want to bring it up, what we want to get is a good understanding of uh, what your knowledge is right now and about viral epitopes and what you want to learn most about viral epitopes. So if you look on the screen right now, we want to know uh, which of these topics do you know most about already? So you'd consider yourself, you know, probably an intermediate uh, understanding of this topic. So if you can see that poll in front of you, we just want you to go down and select the topics that you feel comfortable with. Yes, I know about antibodies. I know what a viral epitope is. I, I know about SARS-CoV-2. So if you could just go down that list. And uh, what we're going to do in a second is then ask you the topics that you want to know about. And this is going to help us guide the discussion today. And uh, as I did a prep call with Dr. Scheuermann yesterday, um, I, I, uh, I, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. The immune system is uh, probably, um, you know, next to the brain, perhaps the most complicated system uh, in the human body. Maybe if in, uh, in biology itself, there's a lot of details. I'm learning a lot of this stuff as we go about uh, viruses and how they attack the human immune system, how we're making antibodies against them, how the virus is evolving, how we're evolving antibodies against the virus and how we're making vaccines. So we're all in this together. I'm your guide. I'm going to help uh, guide you through some of this. Um, and uh, that's why the Q&A is really important as well, so that we get a good sense of uh, what questions you want to ask. You can also up and down vote other people's questions today. So if you see a question that you know the answer to, you can type in and help somebody else out if they have a question. And if you want to ask a particular question, you can ask it in the Q&A box. Raise your hand and you can ask it live. And if there are other questions that people are asking that you want me to ask, you can upvote the questions. So um, I'm going to uh, end that poll right now. We can see, okay, so who, um, what are you most familiar with already? And we can see everybody's pretty familiar with ant antibodies, about one third of you are familiar with viral epitopes, about half of you are familiar with the virus, 37% um, of you with vaccine development, computational approaches. Okay. Uh, and so if we can ask then the second question, and the second question is, what do you want to know most about today? And this is going to help Dr. Scheumann as he goes through the slides that he has and help to, uh, to pitch that. So if you can just take a minute to answer which of these topics you're most interested, you'd like to go uh, the most deep on today uh, to really understand uh, what's going on under the hood of this, uh, this virus. I was actually just speaking with a uh, scientist in uh, Wuhan University this morning who I was in grad school with and uh, was at the lab uh, of, uh, down at Stanford for his postdoc, asking about what the situation is on the ground there. And uh, there's about 500 cases uh, remaining in the hospitals. Most of the people are uh, the elderly who had uh, severe pre-existing conditions. But what's really interesting is the phylogeny of this virus and where it's, uh, how we're seeing divergence in maybe the, um, the, the cases that are occurring in Italy from the cases that occurred in China to the cases that are occurring in the USA. So some exciting news will be coming out of that shortly. So, um, okay, so here's the poll of what people want to know about today. We can, so, so most people are interested in vaccine development. Uh, and, uh, we, we might touch on vaccine development, but that's another topic that certainly um, uh, synthetic genomics, SGI DNA is working a lot on vaccine development. And I was speaking with Dan Gibson there yesterday about some of the work that he's doing. Um, so we may have Dan on the show if people want to know about uh, vaccine development in particular. And then we're seeing the next is uh, viral epitopes. That's good because that's what the topic is for today. Uh, spike proteins. People want to know more about the spike proteins and computational approaches, uh, viral entry and uh, viral evolution and phylogeny. The least people want to know about is B cells and T cells. So that's good. We're not going to do uh, immunology 101 today, which was one of my fears uh, that we would, uh, or one of uh, Richard's fears that we would uh, 
that we will get stuck in, stuck into uh, into that. So great, excellent. Thank you everybody for doing that poll. That helps us understand. And we just want to say um, uh, a couple of things that we have here uh, in terms of where people are dialing in from. So let me just uh, give us a view from the. Uh, we have. Uh, Folks from Johns Hopkins University, folks from Indiana, Alisa from Cambridge, Massachusetts, San Carlos here in the Bay Area, just down the road, Chattanooga, um, Ireland, New Jersey, Germany, Singapore, San Francisco, Milan. Welcome, uh, Claudia. I hope uh, everything is safe for you in Italy. Uh, Edinburgh, uh, Reich dialing in from Kaust in Saudi Arabia. So welcome. Um, and Ottawa. Canada and Oxford in England, somebody from DC. Wow, we got a lot of people joining us today. Um, I see over 140 people uh, are online, so uh, this is fantastic. Um, we do have a couple of questions already, but I'm gonna dive in and introduce Dr. Scheumann. Dr. Scheumann is the site director at the J. Craig Venter Institute in La Jolla, and he has uh, degrees from both um, Stanford and from Cal, and he is an expert on viral epitope mapping. And we're gonna now dive in and welcome Dr. Scheumann to talk all about the viral epitope map mapping. Welcome, Dr. Scheumann. Thanks, John. It's nice to be with you. I'm looking um, forward to, uh, to talking with the SynBio Beta group. It sounds like a pretty interesting organization. I think so. I, uh, we've got a lot of interactivity and a lot of interesting people on the line. So, um, um, so could you just give us a little bit before we dive into the paper? Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about uh, what what the paper was about, and uh, maybe give us a little bit of background as to um, the work you've done before you dove into this virus, and and help us understand um, what what this epitope. First of all, what is an epitope? There were some people wanting to know that, and then uh, and then how does this virus? Uh, get into cells, and then what is this uh, paper that you published just the week before last? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, you know, at the Venture Institute, we have a pretty big research program that's focused on infectious diseases, especially viral infectious diseases. And so we, you know, apply these different kinds of genomic technologies for us to better understand where viral outbreaks are coming from, how the virus is evolving, and how we can use this genomic information to design better therapeutics and diagnostics and also vaccines. And so, you know, we've been working on viral outbreaks, you know, for many, many years. Um, we've been working on the development of universal vaccines for influenza virus, uh, responses to the Zika outbreak, to the Ebola outbreak. Um, and, you know, we really try to use genomics for us to really understand how these viruses, virus outbreaks are occurring. Um, but I think our ultimate goal is to be able to use this information to respond in some effective way. And, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what we know about the immune response to these kinds of viruses, especially this SARS-CoV-2 virus that's causing the COVID-19 outbreak, um, but also to use this information in general to be able to develop better vaccines. Excellent. Well, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, I know that you've prepared some slides. So if you want to bring up the slides, we can start to go through them. And I may interrupt sure. you as we go to, uh, to make sure that everybody's following and, and, and keep track of, uh, of what, we're, what we're... Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to focus my presentation today on, you know, what we've been doing to understand the immune response to SARS-CoV-2. And obviously, we're at a very early stage in that understanding. We don't really know a lot about how the humans are responding to SARS-CoV-2, but we can learn quite a bit from previous uh, research that looked at the human immune response to the original SARS coronavirus. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what can we learn from looking at the previous immune response to SARS? And what kind of kind of computational approaches can we use to predict what the immune response to this new coronavirus might look like, ultimately to use that information for the development of vaccines. So um, at the Venture Institute, we're focused on genomics. And we think about genomics in two ways. The first is we do DNA sequencing of genomes of organisms to try to understand their blueprint. You know, what is it that's given in the genome that instructs the organism to function in certain ways? And so in the case of viruses, we want to understand 
what proteins are encoded in the genome and how those proteins contribute to the pathogenesis of, of the disease, the virulence of the virus, um, where the virus might have originated from, and how the virus is evolving. And I'll show some examples of how we use phylogenetics to really understand where the virus came from and where it's going. And all of that is really derived from the DNA sequence, or in, in this case, the RNA sequence that's coming from um, the organism that we're studying. So and Richard, once we I know, I, sorry to interrupt. I know you're going to uh, get into sure. more detail, and also a lot of our a lot of our audience already understand this. But the the virus that we're talking about is is an RNA virus, so it's got a protein shell around it, and with some spike proteins that you're going to show in a second. And then it's about a thirty thousand base pair, uh, so ACs, uh, uh, Us and Gs, because it's RNA, so it's a uracil instead of instead of thymine. Um, and uh, approximately how many genes are encoded in that 30,000 uh, uh, sequence of RNA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a very interesting structure, and I'll show a schematic of what the genome structure looks like in a minute. But um, the initial set of genes, there are 10 genes that are open reading frames that are initially expressed. But there's one that's ex extremely long. It's called a polyprotein. And that polyprotein then, after it's translated, is divided up into 15 kind of subunits um, from the action of viral proteases. And so in reality, there's about 25 um, independent proteins that are encoded by the virus. And why does the virus use those proteases to chop up the, the protein as a way to get it into the human cell? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that, that protein is, is only expressed once the virus has entered the cells, but why it produces a polyprotein that it then has to chop up into pieces for part of the, of the proteome. And then the other part of the proteome, you know, it just translates those as independent units. It's unclear why the virus would do that, but we see this in many different viruses. Um, the Zika virus does the same thing. It encodes a polyprotein that, that, that then is cleaved into the functional subunits. Very interesting. Okay. And how many approximately of those genes are involved in the structure of the virus, as in the, 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 the outer shell, and how many are involved in the mechanism for replicate? Well, how many, I guess, it hijacks the, the human cells mechan mechanisms of replication, but how many are structural and how many do other things and what kind of other things do they do? Yeah, there are, there are four main structural proteins um, that kind of form the, the, the capsid of the virion particle. Um, and then the rest of them are non-structural and have other kinds of functions like enzymatic. For example, there's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that is embedded within this polyprotein that has to be liberated from proteolytic cleavage, and that's responsible for replicating the RNA genome. Um, so, you know, most of the um, encoded proteins are non-structural. Got it. Great. Please continue. Okay, sure. Yeah, so one side of the equation is doing the DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing to understand the blueprint of the organism. But then once we have that information, you know, I'm sure this, this audience is very familiar with the synthetic biology where we take that information and then resynthesize genomes and resynthesize DNA in order to alter it in very defined ways so that we can engineer organisms to do useful things. And in, in our case, we want to engineer the organism so that it's a much more effective vaccine candidate. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some some thoughts about how um, we're approaching that, that challenge. So um, one of my big projects is to build databases about human pathogenic viruses. And so we have um, a, a public database that's called Viper, the Virus Pathogen Resource. And this is a project that's funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And so I'm sure all of you have met I'm Dr. Fauci, Anthony Fauci. He is the director of NIAID, and his institute funds much of the um, infectious disease research that we do at the Venture Institute. So we're big fans of Tony Fauci. Um, so one of our projects is to build this public database. Um, and very quickly after the SARS-CoV-2 um, outbreak started, we, um, we put together kind of a dedicated portal 
to make it easy for scientists to get access to the latest data and information about SARS-CoV-2. And so on the right-hand side here, I have a screenshot of um, the portal um, into the resource. And then on the left-hand side, you know, we track usage of these resources using Google Analytics and other kinds of tools. And you can see over here, I just have the daily usage of the resource um, during the month of January. Um, at the beginning of January, we typically see about three to 400 users per day come to use the resource to help support um, their research activities. But then somewhere around the middle of January, when people started to get interested in the coronavirus, you can see that our usage statistics went up by a factor of three or four. And so now we're getting about between one and between 1,000 and maybe 1,200 um, users per day who are coming to our resource and trying to get the latest information on the virus. Um, so this is one of the things that we do for the community to really make it in real time, make all of the data that's coming out of the different research programs easily accessible for people to build upon in their research programs. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a schematic of what the, the virus particle looks like. Um, and as I mentioned, there are these four structural proteins that form the capsid of the virus, um, and they're illustrated here. The most important one for our discussion today is this spike glycoprotein, which exists as a, a trimer on the surface of that virion particle. And you can see that if you look at the, the, um, the structure of the virion, it does look like a crown. And that's where the coronavirus got its name from is, and you've seen, I'm sure you've seen electron micrographs and things like that of the virus. Um, and it definitely looks like this kind of a crown structure. And it's really because of that spike glycoprotein that's sticking um, out of the, the virion. Um, the other thing that's worth noting here is that this is what's known as an enveloped virus. And so there's actually a lipid bilayer membrane um, that coats the surface of the virion. And one of the reasons why washing your hands with soap and water is very effective against this virus is because that disrupts that lipid bilayer. Soap is a great way of dissolving lipids, and so you wash your hands with soap and water and you destroy um, the structure of this, this virus particle. And Richard, apologies, I'm not familiar with the term virion. Is that just a single virus is a virion and virus is plural? Well, virus, we talk about virus more in general terms, whereas a virion is that particle, um, that single particle. Um, and it, you know, it's also known as a virus, but um, you know, we, when we're talking about the particle, we tend to use that term virion. Got it. And can you give us a sketch? So that a virion is a single viral particle, a single virus. Can you give us a sense of the scale that um, if, I, if I sneeze right now and, and uh, you know, in a, in a droplet of my saliva as I sneeze, if I'm infected with that virus, how many, how many viral particles, how many virions would be inside uh, one of those droplets? Any idea? Yeah. That's an interesting question, and my wife asked me the same question, actually, and you know, I just, on the back of the napkin calculation, I mean, it, it obviously depends on the stage of infection that you're in, but if you're in kind of an acute phase where there's a lot of viral replication going on, you know, there's probably on the order of 100,000 to a million viral particles in, you know, in one of these little droplets. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of virus that um, comes out um, when, when people sneeze and cough and, and things like that. And if I'm one of these poor patients who's in Wuhan right now, one of the 500 who's still critically ill in hospital and, and assuming that, that I'm, you know, at the peak of the epidemic, if my body is, is really fighting off this virus, I mean, we've, there's, I think there's 100 trillion human cells in the, in the human body. So how many are we talking? In, in, and does, is the virus in all of those cells? Is it just in the respiratory tract? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I think we're just now getting a sense for how extensive the infection um, becomes in the body. Certainly, we can detect uh, viral RNA in stool and in blood. Um, we, we don't have too much information about what other tissues might get involved, but certainly the respiratory tract, um, but it's not limited to the respiratory tract. It does seem to be able to get into other tissues in the body. Got it. And my friend who I was speaking to this morning in, in, in Wuhan was saying that uh, just particularly the, the, the toilet is, is one of the worst places for, 
for infection that, that it's in the, the feces of, of, of folks. And, uh, you know, when you flush the toilet, suddenly the brain, the room is full of, of, of viral particles. So very, uh, right, very right. Uh, sad situation there. Um, and, and a related question, if you look at uh, viral load in general, let's say uh, coronavirus, I, I, I learned last week, is responsible for about 25% of common colds, not this particular horrible right. strain of the coronavirus, but in general, it's a very common virus, uh, causes the common cold. And, and then influenza, uh, clearly we, we all know about the annual uh, seasonal influenza. Are these viruses in our bodies all the time and that, and that we're fighting them off all, all the time? And then once they reach a certain level above um, that's when we, you know, get a cold, or that's when our head bungs up, or our, or we get a chest infection. Is it is it constantly a, a a war going on with with our antibodies that are producing all with our immune system that's producing all these antibodies, just continuously trying to get rid of it, and then sometimes we just can't do it, and it, and we get overrun. Is that what's happening? Yeah. So you know, there are two kinds of viruses. There are viruses like influenza and coronaviruses where you have an acute infection, then your immune system responds to that and eliminates the virus from your body. And so after people have recovered and are in convalescence, um, the virus is no longer present. So those are kind of acute viruses. But then we have other viruses that maintain chronic infections. The best examples of those in humans are herpes viruses. Um, and you probably have heard the expression that herpes lasts forever. Um, once you're infected with herpes virus, they kind of take up residence in your nervous system and they just kind of sit around there um, for long periods of time, really not causing very many um, problems, except occasionally they will break out and cause cold sores or in the case of um, chicken pox, the varicella zoster virus, can reemerge um, in adults, in the elderly, and cause zoster, which is a quite painful disease. But it's the same virus that caused chicken pox when they were a kid. Is that shingles? Um, so that, yeah, shingles, right. Got it. And, and so, the same you know, with malaria. Two types of viruses, but, um, but coronaviruses, they're acute um, viral infections. So it's not going to hang around and last once we got rid of it. Should, should, should we no. go? Right. Great. Okay, please continue. And, uh, and, and just okay. so we started off on the very end, then you were describing the trimers. So these trimers meaning three, so you've got these three yellow glycoproteins and then uh, the lipid bilayer, you said, that's the, uh, the envelope there. Um, and there's, it looks like a couple of different kinds of lipids. Is that right? Um, well, so there are some proteins that are also embedded in this lipid bilayer. So there's this membrane protein and also this um, envelope protein. Um, so the lipid bilayer is kind of illustrated in blue here, and then you have these other proteins that are kind of sitting into, in that bilayer. Great, okay. And for those who aren't used to looking at structural maps mapped to, to genomic data, you can see at the bottom there, that is the sequence. So that is assuming the 30,000 yeah. bases as a DNA, and you can see the different colors of the genes map onto the different uh, structural properties of the virus there. Right, so these are the, the 10 open reading frames, the 10 uh, initial proteins that are expressed from the viral RNA, and they're given you know, clever names like open reading frame six and op open reading frame eight. It turns out that there's a lot we don't know about these viruses and what these different proteins do. And so for the time being, we just give these kind of generic names to them. But obviously there's intensive research going on now to try to understand more about what these different proteins do. And then at the beginning here, this is this large open reading frame that I mentioned, and this is not drawn to scale. Um, this probably takes up two thirds of the viral genome um, if it were drawn to scale. And this is the um, polyprotein that then is cut up into these 15 different um, mature peptides that are the functional um, units um, derived from that polyprotein. Great, thank you. And tomorrow, uh, so not tomorrow, Thursday morning at 8 a.m., we've got a very exciting town hall taking place with the CEO of Nanome. And Nanome is a virtual environment for looking at protein structures. And we're going to be joined by Rob Reiner, who's developing two antibodies as a mechanism for uh, detecting coronavirus. And we're also going to be joined by Robert Scoble, who is a VR guru, and uh, Philip Roseman, who is the founder of Second Life. So we're going to be doing the whole thing in VR, and you can come, and we're going to be able to toggle on and off different pieces of the protein. We're going to be able to zoom in and out. And if you're interested in structure 
and function and how, how these things dock together, uh, then join us on Thursday morning live at 8 a.m. for what's going to be a very exciting, uh, exciting uh, town hall. And Richard, if you could just go back one slide, I just have one final question on the structure. If you could just go into detail a little bit more on what these, uh, these green balls are. Yeah, so the green balls here are the, called, called the nucleoproteins. And so these proteins actually kind of coat the viral RNA that's in the middle of that virion particle. And it's partly to kind of protect that RNA. RNA molecules can be quite um, sensitive to um, um, ribonucleases that are in the environment. And so typically what you see with these RNA viruses is that the, the viral genome is coated with a whole series of these proteins just to kind of protect it and help package it inside the middle of that virion particle. Fascinating. Great. We have a lot of questions. If you want to ask your question live, make sure to type the question into the Q&A box and then raise your hand and then we'll come to those questions shortly. And I'm, uh, I'm asking too many questions, so I'm going to be quiet for a few minutes and let you, uh, let you continue, Richard. So thank you. Okay. Um, so getting into kind of where we're going with the genomics analysis, I think there are two big questions that we want to try to use genomic data to help us answer. The first one is where did the novel coronavirus come from? Um, this is important to understand because we want to prevent these kinds of outbreaks from happening in the future. So knowing where the virus is coming from can help us develop mitigation strategies to prevent the next outbreak. And then the second is now that the virus is circulating in humans, we want to look to see if it's evolving in ways that might make it become more aggressive because it's already pretty aggressive. Um, you know, obviously we have a relatively high case fatality rate. Um, it's very fairly transmissible from human to human, but um, if it were to become even more aggressive, you can imagine um, what kind of devastating impact that would have. So we also want to try to understand how is the virus evolving? And this also can have important implications for vaccine development. And I'll come back to that point in a minute, is that if there are regions of the, of the genome that are evolving rapidly, we want to avoid targeting those as we're developing vaccines because the virus can very quickly evolve to become resistant to the vaccines that we're developing. And this is a concept that I'm going to come back to and try to make the point that maybe if we think very carefully about this problem, we can come up with better strategies for developing vaccines that are going to be cross-protective and resistant to these um, evolutionary pressures and that the virus experiences. Um, so that, that's what I'm going to try to get to. Um, and we use a technique to understand viral evolution called phylogenetics. And actually, I think most people are pretty familiar with the concept of, of a tree structure to illustrate the relationship between organ, organisms. And this is an example of a family tree that kind of illustrates the relationship between individual humans. So this is the family tree of Queen Elizabeth. And you can see that we can represent the familial relationships using this tree structure. And so, you know, people who are on different branches of the tree are more or less related to each other based on the structure of this family tree. How dare you leave off Meghan Marples? <laughs> yeah, this is an old version, <laughs> so I need to get it updated. Um, so good. But um, so what we do is we actually use the genome sequence to construct a similar kind of family tree of viruses um, based on the sequence similarity um, between these viruses. And so this is now an example of a phylogenetic tree that we did probably about three weeks ago um, based on the sequence data that was available for the coronavirus at the time. And so the first thing that we can do here is we can use this information to try to figure out where did this virus come from? So I've color coded in red here. These are all the isolates for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So the, the recent outbreak virus um, and these um, isolates come from China, they come from Europe, they come from the United States. Um, and um, so these are all located in this branch of the phylogenetic tree. Now we can come up here and ask, well, what is, besides these human coronaviruses, are there other coronavirus isolates that are 
most similar to SARS-CoV-2. And it turns out that this green isolate right here is the one that seems to be the most similar. Um, and it's these branch lengths here, these horizontal branch lengths, that indicate the, the relative similarity of the genome sequences. Um, so this is the isolate that's a non-human isolate that is most closely related. They share a common ancestor represented by this node in the phylogenetic tree. And this isolate comes from a bat that was isolated in the Wuhan region of China. Now, you, you may have seen in the news that um, people thought, well, there seems to be some intermediary host between the bat and humans because humans don't interact very much in, with, with bats. Um, and so we thought that there must be some intermediary host that's moving the virus from the bats to the humans. And one of the initial um, culprits was thought to be this uh, interesting creature called a pangolin, which kind of looks like an armadillo. But we think that actually the pangolin was not the intermediate host in this case. And, and here's the, the evidence for that. So you can see that um, here the, in purple, these are different isolates from pangolins. And you can see that based on the branch length of these phylogenetic trees, those isolates are still quite different from the human isolates and also quite different from this bat isolate, which is more closely related. Now, up here at the top of the phylogenetic tree, this is, um, these are isolates related to the original SARS outbreak, which happened in 2003. Um, in black, these are human isolates. In green here are bat isolates. And so we think, again, that that SARS coronavirus also um, shared a common an ancestor with bat viruses. But in blue here, this is an isolate that was obtained from this palm civet creature over here. And in this case, we think that the palm civet was that intermediary host between bat and human. And the reason that we think that's the case is that if you look at the branch lengths in the phylogenetic tree, the sequence of the civet isolate are almost identical to the human isolates. Whereas for the pangolin, it, they're very different. So if it really is the intermediate host to initiate the human outbreak, you expect to see these very short branch lengths between the intermediate host and the human host. And we're not seeing that with pangolin. So at this stage, we're not sure what that intermediate host is. Um, there seems to be some gap between the bat and the human. And Richard, when you say we, are you working directly with scientists and virologists in China? Is, and is there a global group of scientists that are all using your database to collaborate on this and try to figure out what went on? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is a global research effort and we collaborate with scientists all over the world. Um, our database is open to the international community. And so we have um, researchers from 150 different countries come and, and use our database. So it's, it's widely used. I've been to Wuhan. They have a terrific human virology unit in Wuhan. So um, actually we're kind of fortunate that the outbreak originated there because they definitely had the expertise and, you know, um, the first report of this kind of um, initial cluster of cases in China was, you know, the end of, of 2019, end of December. And we had the first genome sequence was released by the Chinese scientists on January 11th. So it was amazing how quickly they determined that the COVID was being caused by a coronavirus and they determined the, the whole genome sequence, the 30,000 nucleotide sequence, and then they immediately released it to the public um, so that everybody else could start working on building vaccines and diagnostics and, and things. I mean, I have to give the Chinese a lot of credit for being very open early on in the outbreak and really um, engaging the entire um, international research community to help them tackle that, the outbreak. Right. And I think it's worth pointing out there's a lot of conspiracy theories about this being a bioweapon designed in a lab. There is no evidence for that. People can look up the, the analysis that people have done. There's some conspiracy theories that the Chinese knew about this a year ahead of time. Um, that's one of the questions I asked my, my friend who I've known for, for 20 years uh, this morning. He's at the front line of this. He said there's no evidence for that either. So I think it's worth pointing out there's a lot of misinformation and ratcheting up of, of nationalism, both on the Chinese side and on the American side right now. So it's really good to hear that you've got close relationships and that you're working with virologists in China to try to get to the truth and, and understand the science behind of this. 
Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So, so that's you know how we use this kind of phylogenetics of genome sequences to try to figure out where these outbreak viruses are coming from. So then the next question is where is the virus going? And if you look at all of these sequences from the human isolates, um, and these come from all over the, the globe, you can see that the branch lengths in the phylogenetic trees are extremely short. These independent isolates are almost identical with each other. Now, that is changing over time, and we're expecting that the virus is going to continue to evolve. Um, and we're keeping kind of a close eye on, you know, when we're seeing major changes in the viral genome um, to track the evolution of the virus, and then to try to use that information to understand, well, what, what's driving the evolution of the virus? Is it becoming more transmissible between humans? And that's why, you know, a new lineage might emerge that is even more infectious than what we currently have. And obviously that would be something of, of great concern if, if we see that kind of evidence in the evolution of the virus. Um, but right now, the changes that we're seeing are pretty subtle, and we're not seeing really major evidence of a switch in a particular lineage from this initial outbreak um, lineage. But that may change. Okay, so to immune epitopes. All right. Um, so we did um, publish a paper very recently in Cell Host and Microbe where we um, used a combination of approaches to try to um, anticipate what the immune response to CoV-2 might look like. Um, we used a sequence homology-based approach based on our knowledge of um, how the immune system recognizes the original SARS coronavirus. And then we also used a bioinformatics and, and artificial intelligence machine learning approach to try to predict um, uh, how the immune system is going to recognize this new coronavirus. And that's um, all described in, in this publication. And I should point out that this was a, a terrific collaboration between um, my group at the Venture Institute and Bjorn Peters and Alex Setta and their colleagues at the um, La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology. Um, the La Jolla Institute group also builds a very useful database resource, a public database resource that's focused on immune epitopes. It's called the Immune Epitope Database and Analysis Resource. It's also funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and they are focused on looking in the scientific literature and identifying experiments where people are identifying and characterizing immune epitopes and then loading that information into their database to make it um, use, you know, easy for, for other investigators to use. And so for our Viper resource, we then go to their database, extract that information, and then map it onto genome sequences and try to integrate what we know about immune epitope responses and um, what we know about genomics and, and viral evolution. So it's a very kind of synergistic relationship and that's exactly what's reflected in this paper is coming together and combining the genomics analysis with the immune epitope analysis to try to help understand and predict what the immune response might look like. And so sequence homology, for those who are not familiar with it, is, is taking all the sequences that exist for a particular uh, virus, in this case, the, the, uh, the SARS virus, which was the, also a coronavirus, and looking at the current sequences of the new virus, so SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, lining them all up and then seeing which, which ACs, Ts and Gs, or ACs, Us and Gs are different, and then being able to apply machine learning techniques on it to try to understand uh, why, where the differences are and the effect that that's going to have on the uh, human, on entry into the human immune system. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So here, this is an example of what these kind of sequence alignments look like. Um, on the top row here, this is the original Wuhan isolate. Below it are the two, two bat sequences that we think, you know, share a common ancestor with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And you can see here that these are, these are some of the positions that support that, that hypothesis, that they share a common ancestor. And you can see that there are several positions where they, they have the same um, nucleotide sequence. 
And then down here in the middle here, these are the original coronaviruses. And so that's why we say that the Wuhan CoV-2 is more similar to this bat um, virus than it is to the original SARS coronavirus. So that's the kind of sequence alignment and inference we can make based on, on that sequence alignment. Great. And I can see we have a lot of questions coming in. We have 11 questions and we'll get to the questions very shortly. If you can help me decide which questions we want to ask by upvoting them. And then if you want to ask your question live, just raise your hand and we'll call upon you to ask it live. So back to you, Richard. Okay. Um, yeah. So back to sequence conservation, then we can actually look at the extent of sequence conservation um, using multiple isolates from different groups of viruses and in this case, we've broken it down based on these 10 open reading frames um, of the Wuhan uh, CoV-2. And down here in this table, you can kind of see we've, we've calculated the extent of sequence identity um, for three different groups of viruses. The, these bat isolates that seem to share a common ancestor with CoV-2, the original SARS coronavirus, and then this MERS virus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus um, that um, people are probably familiar with. Um, and you can see that, you know, as I was describing, you know, the bat sequence in this large open reading frame is 95% identical to the SARS-CoV-2 human isolates. Um, in the case of the original SARS, there's 86% amino acid identity. Um, in that large open reading frame. But with the MERS virus, it's only 50%. And if you look down the chart here, you can see that, you know, some of the um, proteins are more or less conserved across these different um, groups of viruses. So like the E protein and the M protein are very similar, whereas the spike glycoprotein, that protein that sits on the, the surface of the virion, tends to be the most variable and the least well conserved among all the different viruses. And that's obviously very relevant for our understanding of how the immune system is recognizing these virus particles and um, whether a vaccine developed against SARS would be cross protective against SARS-CoV-2. Um, so you know, th th that's why we, we look at the extent of sequence conservation in this context. Great, thank you. Um, so that, that's just kind of a quick overview of, of what we know. So, so now let's talk a little bit about the um, antibody epitopes. So as you mentioned earlier, John, that the, the epitope is the part of the virus protein that the antibody binds to. So there's this physical interaction between the antibody and viral proteins. And the site of that interaction on the viral protein, that's the antibody epitope. That's the part that's recognized by your, your antibody, the antibody part of your immune system. So we, we really don't have any information about the human immune response to CoV-2 yet. That information is just now starting to come out. So at the time we did the study, we decided to take two different approaches. The first one is to look at, well, what do we know about the human immune response to the original SARS coronavirus? And so in the immune epitope database, we actually had information for about 400 epitope experiments where an experiment was done to, to determine where is the binding site for antibodies against the original SARS coronavirus. And so this um, graph here is a compilation of all of that information to look to where are we seeing kind of dominant antibody responses, what part of the viral protein is, seems to be most recognized by the immune system. And we call that the immunodominant regions. Um, these are epitopes that are frequently targeted by the immune response. And, and those are illustrated by these five peaks here. And this is just a score of this kind of immunodominance, how frequently we see these epitopes come out of experiments. And so, um, the interesting thing here is that, so there are these five regions that um, are preferentially targeted by the immune response, and this is in the spike glycoprotein. Um, and you can think of them as falling into two general categories, what I'm calling variable epitope regions and conserved epitope regions. So the variable epitope regions here, this is the extent of 
sequence um, identity between SARS, the original SARS coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2. So this region in the spike protein is quite different between SARS and SARS-CoV-2. And that's true for um, these three. In contrast, you have conserved epitope regions. In this case, this, the sequence of CoV-2 is identical to the sequence of SARS. So this is actually really important information because the ideal situation is that you want to target regions of these proteins that are conserved. Because the reason that the sequences are conserved is it's likely that those regions of the proteins have important functional properties. And they're not allowed to evolve because if you mutate that functional, functionally important region, you destroy the function of the protein. And so regions of proteins that are highly conserved tend to be very functional, and regions that are variable don't have that strong functional constraint. Um, they're allowed to mutate, they're allowed to vary, and it doesn't impact the fitness of the virus. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. Now, what I've illustrated on the right-hand side, this is the three-dimensional structure of the spike trimer that was determined by X-ray crystallography. And I'm going to start this um, movie. It's going to spin around so you can kind of see what the structure looks like. Um, and in, in the kind of blue highlighted colors on the side, those are the variable epitope regions. And the more pinkish color, those are the conserved epitope regions. And you can see where they're located in the context of this trimer structure. And so if you think about this trimer sitting on the top of the, of the virion, these variable epitope regions are kind of near the, the top of it, whereas the conserved epitope regions are kind of buried in the middle. And so the virus has, viruses are, are kind of tricky in this way. They entice the immune system to recognize certain parts of the virion surface, and they have evolved such that those parts of the viral protein are not that important for the viral to, virus to function. And so you're, you're basically enticing the immune system to recognize parts of the viral protein that are not functionally important and therefore can evolve. So as we develop herd immunity to the coronavirus, this virus is going to start mutating these regions to then evade detection by that antibody response. So it's almost like it's giving out a false uh, signal to uh, to the antibodies. They're uh, they're binding to that part of the virion, and then they're uh, but but that part can can evolve the quickest, and it's it's not functional. Right, right. So you know, so that's what we saw when we looked at um, the epitope regions from the original SARS. And then the second thing that we did was then we used machine learning algorithms to look at the actual SARS-CoV-2 sequence and see if we could predict where um, the immune response might be targeted on SARS-CoV-2 using predictive algorithms, um, artificial intelligence machine learning. And, and these are um, the highest predicted uh, epitopes from that kind of machine learning approach. And again, you kind of see that there are these um, positions that are located near the top of that virion or the, the spike protein trimer here. And then there are other ones that are kind of buried deeper in, in that structure. And once again, we see that the, um, the level of sequence conservation of these exposed predicted epitopes is relatively low, and these buried ones is relatively high. And the, so, uh, I'm not the, familiar with this kind of diagram with the red ball, so that's just indicating that uh, that's just a, a three-dimensional way to show where the uh, where the binding regions are. Yeah, so you know these are the ribbon diagrams here that kind of give you a sense for the structural elements of the protein, and then we've just highlighted the specific predicted regions using the space filling model. Great. They're just different ways of modeling the structure. Got it. Excellent. Um, yeah. So, so this is kind of what we know. Now, the, the, my last slide is, okay, coming back full circle, with this information in hand, what can we 
do with this? How can we build better vaccines? Um, and so what we're doing now is using synthetic genomics to try to synthesize um, spike protein um, sequences and, and genome sequences in such a way that can we, can we trick the immune system to ignore these regions and have it focus on these regions down here? And, and that's, the, that's the kind of conceptual revolution in vaccine design that we're really trying to explore right now. And we have some ideas about how we might be able to do that. And so we're now just kind of pitching some of these ideas to the funding agencies to see if they'd be willing to, you know, give us some money to explore, um, you know, this kind of novel approach to vaccine development, taking into account what we know about these variable and conserved epitope regions and use that information for better vaccine development. Great. Thank you, Richard. Apart from funding, is there anything else that you need from the community? Um, what, one thing that um, we're very interested in, in obtaining are samples from convalescent patients because, you know, in order to, all of, all of this information here on the original SARS coronavirus is actually coming from, you know, antibodies from patients and from vaccine recipients and things like that. And so this is a real a view of what the immune response is looking like. You know, this is all predicted right now. So what we want to do is get serum from convalescent patients and then do the kind of mapping that was done for the original SARS coronavirus to really understand, you know, what is being recognized by the immune system. But, you know, obviously these patients have gone through a lot. Um, you know, we, we don't want to abuse them, you know, as they're recovering from this you know, horrible disease. But the good thing about the immune response is it lasts for a while. And so we can go to these patients, you know, a month or two down the road and get some, some blood from them and be able to do this kind of serology evaluation down the road. So that's something that we're looking forward to in the near future. Got it. And convalescence just means that a patient has recovered. Is that right? Correct. So we have uh, actually been helping to connect some people who uh, had um, COVID-19 early in the epidemic to uh, researchers, both uh, Joe DeRisi at UCSF and uh, Jim Crow at Vanderbilt. And, uh, and there's mm -hmm. a new project that Berkeley Lights is just embarking on with UCSF, where they're going to be uh, taking uh, uh, blood samples from patients, looking for B cells inside of it, and uh, looking for those antibodies that make the, uh, the uh, antibodies against the uh, COVID-19 uh, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, we can also loop you into that project, Richard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know Jim very well. We work together on a number of different projects. So, um, right. and uh, yeah. We hope to have him on the um, show. That, that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. Excellent. And uh, I apologize. We, we, uh, we've uh, only got a couple of minutes more to go until 9 a.m. Richard, we do have a lot of really good questions. Would you be happy to go maybe 10 minutes over to answer them? Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, uh, thanks for all the great questions. We're going to go a few minutes over to answer them. Let's just, uh, if you want to unshare your screen, Richard, and the first question is from Ellen Jorgensen. Uh, Tony Fauci said publicly that he feels that the immunity to SARS-CoV-2 will last for years once a patient has been infected and recovered. Is he basing this on new data on how fast the virus mutates, antibody surveys, etc., or just in comparison to other coronaviruses? Yeah, I think it's mainly in comparison with our experience with other coronaviruses. Certainly, you know, if you look at um, people who recovered from SARS, um, they have, you can detect um, T cell, um, memory T cells and antibodies, you know, several years after their original infection. And so um, I agree with Tony that I expect that once people have recovered from this virus, they will have um, long lasting immunity. Now, the question is, as, as the uh, questioner points out, is what happens if the virus evolves? You know, that's what we see with seasonal flu. And that's why we have to develop new vaccines every couple of years, because through this process of antigenic drift, the virus has evolved and mutated to escape recognition from that initial immune response. Now, whether we're going to see that with coronaviruses or not, it's unclear. 
whether we're going to see you know, repeated waves of infection of SARS-CoV-2 is unclear. We didn't see that with SARS, but we do see that with these seasonal coronaviruses, these cold the coronaviruses that cause colds. So I think the jury's still out, um, but I think at least in the short term, people who have um, been infected and recovered will have short-term immunity, at least maybe for a couple of years. Great, thank you. Il Min asks, there is a study suggesting that anti-spike IgG may make COVID-19 worse. The suggested mechanism is anti-spike IgG render macrophage phenotype from wound healing to pro-inflammatory, causing severe lung inflammation. Any thoughts? And if you could just define what IgG is for everybody, please. Yeah, IgG is a type of antibody. So um, this concept that the antibody might be you know, detrimental instead of beneficial um, is, is being floated out there. And I, I would say at this point, it's still unclear if that's true or not. But this originally comes from another disease um, that's caused by a virus called dengue virus, which is a flavivirus in the same family as Zika. And um, it's well characterized now that dengue has this phenomenon called antibody-dependent enhancement where it seems like the antibody binds to the virion particle, and then the, the bottom part of the antibody is recognized by macrophages. The macrophage brings that inside the cell, and at the same time, it's bringing the virus in the cell as well, and causing kind of a, an inflammatory response as a result. So there is some evidence to suggest that antibodies do have that kind of a role in dengue a hemorrhagic fever, so de very severe um, response to dengue infection. I think in this case, it's unlikely that that's going on with this current outbreak and with um, you know the severe disease that's caused by CoV-2, because I don't think we have much pre-existing antibody in people who are getting infected, right? So for this antibody-dependent enhancement, you have to have antibodies there already, um, and in this case, we haven't been exposed to a virus that looks like CoV-2. It's unlikely that we have a lot of antibody that would recognize it you know, at the initiation of infection. And so at least for the severity of disease we're seeing now, it's probably not due to that phenomenon. But you know, I think it's, it's early stage, early um, phase in, in, in really exploring that, that hypothesis. Great. Isaac Larkin, you have three great questions. The next three are yours. Maybe do you want to come, if you've got a microphone, do you want to unmute yourself and you can, um, excuse me, you can ask your questions live. Uh, Peter Romanowski wants to know about the viral particle load. Is one viral particle enough or does there need to be a specific load to overwhelm the nonspecific immune response? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think we don't know too much about that for coronaviruses, but, um, you know, in other models of respiratory infection, you know, the number of viral particles um, can be pretty, pretty small in, you know, in that droplet particle that you're exposed to. I mean, you know, tens of viral particles um, may be enough to initiate the infection, um, at least for things like influenza. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, Isaac, if you want to just introduce yourself and uh, maybe you can try to combine some of the questions into one. Yeah, hi there. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Northwestern, trying to keep it down. My wife's got a call in the other room. Um, and uh, the, uh, so actually talking about antibody dependent enhancement, one of the questions I had was, you know, a, a concern for potential experimental vaccines is if they provoke a mediocre or a weak immune response you might get this antibody independent enhancement. So is that a concern for vaccine candidates? Um, and uh, what do vaccine researchers do to avoid antibody dependent enhancement in their uh, vaccines? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is a concern. And I think people who are working on the development of vaccines are now very sensitive to this possibility and are looking out for it. You know, unfortunately, I would, I would have to be honest and say that you know, our approach to vaccine development is very empirical. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily use a very kind of directed engineering approach to vaccine development. Typically what we do is we take, you know, the, the naturally occurring virus 
and we either attenuate it in some way um, or we just um, develop vaccines based on individual subunits of the virus. Um, but then we just kind of inject that into people and hope they develop a protective immune response. Um, but I have not seen, you know, any approaches where people, you know, have specifically designed the vaccine in order to avoid something like antibody dependent enhancement. Um, so, you know, I think uh, we can be doing a, a much better job in vaccine engineering than we are currently. Um, and I hope, you know, that's the direction that the field is going to be taking. Great, Great. thank you. Um, so my second question is, um, how does the three-dimensional structure, like the presentation of the antigen, impact the strength of the immune response? And uh, connected to that, like, is it known if you co-express just the structural proteins for SARS-CoV-2, uh, whether those can self-assemble into like empty virions that could serve as a, a mm -hmm. vaccine antigen? Yeah. Um, I, that's a good, really good question. I do think that, you know, mimicking a virion structure, a virion particle, um, will give a more effective immune response. You know, just putting spike proteins out there in solution, you know, typically does, you know, in, in, in general, I think that strategy does not elicit as strong of an immune response as when you, where, when you have this particle that has multiple subunits that are kind of decorated around that particle. The immune system seems to recognize those things much more effectively. Now, whether, you know, just using spike protein or also including, you know, the E and M proteins that are also within that lipid bilayer, whether that would further improve the recognition of that virion um, is unclear to me at, the, at, at this point. But people are trying to develop virus-like particles as vaccine candidates should try to mimic that, that multivalent structure, that, that kind of multi-subunit structure that you see on, on virion particles. Fantastic. And then my last question is, um, is it known whether different coronavirus strains, if they co-infect the same cell, can recombine? And if you look at the SARS-CoV-2 genome and its phylogeny, if you look at just specific sections or ORFs, do the different sections and ORFs have different phylogeny or is it the same phylogeny across all of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far, um, we haven't seen any evidence of recombination with either with SARS or with SARS-CoV-2, but I think it's, it's kind of early stages and we, we would need to have a situation where you have two lineages are co-circulating in the same regions where you could potentially get um, co-infection and, and recombination. And I think we just, we're not seeing that yet. Um, but um, in terms of, I, you know, I think probably where we might be able to explore that question would be with the cold uh, causing coronaviruses, because there we do see these multiple lineages that kind of co-circulate um, and I think looking for evidence of recombination for coronaviruses in general, we'll probably be more likely to see it um, looking at, at those coronaviruses. But uh, I'm not familiar with if people have looked at for that yet or not, but um, certainly worth investigating. Great. Thanks thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Richard. Uh, last two questions uh, we're going to take uh, from Casey Lipmeyer at Conagen. How important is the membrane spanning domain for eliciting immunoprotection? Um, I think where it becomes important is that if you if you want to kind of mimic these vi virus-like particles, you want to have that membrane domain and that lipid bilayer in there because that helps kind of organize the structure of that virion particle. Um, so, you know, to the extent that mimicking that structure will elicit a more effective immune response, then I think that um, transmembrane region will be important just so you generate that, that virus-like particle structure. Great. And the last question from Jonathan Price. Uh, we had the CEO of Moderna on the show last week, um, Stefan Bansell. And uh, Jonathan wants to know, how does the Moderna uh, 1273 mRNA work in relation to what you've just described? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know that, you know, Moderna has a really terrific RNA-based vaccine platform that seems to be quite effective. Um, I, I assume that they're targeting the um, the spike protein um, in their 
messenger RNA based vaccine. Um, but I don't know the details about how much of the of the open reading frame is included and whether the membrane um, part is included. Um, so sorry, don't know. Yeah, and it was we, it was targeting the spike protein, and and uh, uh, for those interested in more about the Moderna vaccine, you can go onto YouTube and see the town hall that we did with uh, with Stefan last week. We've come to our end of time. Uh, I, sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but thank you all for the great comments and the great questions. And uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. We know that you're very busy with this and we appreciate all the, the work that you and the J. Craig Venture Institute are doing. Tomorrow we have George Church doing our town hall at 8 a.m. And on Thursday, we have the Nanome CEO doing a 3D walkthrough of the protein structure. And on Friday this week, we have Jim Collins from MIT. So we look forward to having you join us again in the future. And thanks again, Richard. We appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks, everybody. Okay, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye now. Bye.